Hello, Hive Nation. Welcome back to the Hive Nation podcast. Each week, we have leading experts in personal and professional development share their journeys and expertise to help you connect, engage, grow, and evolve. Nation, ladies and gentlemen, today we have a return guest, Rod Collins, on, and we're joined with Larry Cooper as well, our other partner out in Ottawa. And today we're going to be reviewing uh, Rod's new book, which comes out uh, tomorrow or February 20th. So with that, I'll hand it over to Larry uh, to introduce uh, Rod in a little bit more depth. Thank you, Greg, for for the intro. And uh... As you mentioned, we have Rod back, and uh, it's for his second appearance on our broadcast, on our podcast that we had him on a little over, or a little under a year ago, I should say. Uh, And this time, he's out with a new book called Nobody is Smarter Than Everybody. Um, And uh, having known Rob uh, for about uh, 11 years now, uh, and from the very first time I met him, a lot of the topics that are in this book actually go back even further than that with Rod. He was talking about this stuff. Uh, a long time ago, in some cases, almost 20 years ago or more. Um, so this, uh, I would guess, Rod, this is kind of a culmination for you of uh, a lot of experience, uh, a lot of the things that you've seen, a lot of the people that you've talked to, uh, and you're kind of bringing it all together now to share uh, with the world and a lot of other people who may not be aware uh, of this new way of thinking about organizations. Um, so with that, uh, why don't we get started? So Greg, are you, uh, do you have some questions to get started? Yeah. So the very first one I think is a great place to start is Rod, could you explain the title? Nobody is smarter than everybody. What, what does that mean? And, and what can, what can you expand on that? The core of it is the highest form of human intelligence is human collective intelligence. And that's, uh, that's a hard concept for a lot of people because our whole cultures, our whole schooling system is all based on the idea of, ex- of advancing and expanding individual knowledge. That if we can make everybody smart, then the world will be smarter. But there's a problem with human nature. And the problem is this. We have a lot of unconscious biases. And those unconscious biases actually work against our intelligence. There are two psychologists, uh, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, who did some terrific work over the course of 30 years. Uh, Kahneman actually won a Nobel Prize in economics, even though he was a psychologist, because he disproved the fundamental uh, uh, principle upon which economics is built. And that is that humans are rational decision makers. They showed we're not. And what makes us irrational decision makers is so many of our structures are set up to amplify and to leverage individual intelligence. The top-down hierarchy is built upon the notion if we take the smartest individuals and give them the power to command and control organizations, then those organizations will be smarter than they otherwise would be. And it turns out that's not true. The beauty of human collective intelligence is it corrects for our individual biases. And one of, and, and, but it is a fundamental foundation that's necessary, which I have to say today is in jeopardy. And that is we have to welcome diversity of opinion. We have to respect all ideas, no matter how eccentric. It's not that we want to amplify eccentric ideas. It's that everybody has a piece to contribute to our higher intelligence. And so an analogy I'll use is, you would never want 100% garlic sauce on your your pasta, but you don't want a tomato sauce without some garlic in it. So 
even we don't want to build something around everybody's eccentric ideas, but there are some eccentricities that when combined with other other knowledge winds up resulting in breakthrough thinking. So let me just uh, close out the answer to this question with something that our entire audience will be able to relate to. There is one area that understands that nobody is smarter than everybody and shifted to a different management model, abandoned command and control, and embraced what I call the peer-to-peer -peer network model. And that is the cockpit. Why don't we have so many airplane crashes anymore? Those of us who are old enough to remember the 70s and 80s, uh, in North America, we had three to four crashes per year. I remember when I first became a traveling employee back in the 70s, every time I got on an airplane, I mentally thought, I hope I'm not on one of the three or four that'll happen this year. I don't think that anymore. And what happened? What happened, it goes back, there was a, uh, there was a crash in the United States. Uh, it was in Portland, Oregon, back in 1978. And when the NTSB team was listening to the cockpit tapes, they were stunned because the reason this plane crashed was that it ran out of fuel. And so they're thinking, how can an experienced crew of three people run out of fuel? And as they listened to the cockpit tapes, they realized that two of the three pilots in the cockpit were very concerned about the fuel level, but neither one was the captain. The captain was myopically focused on trying to figure out whether or not the right landing gear was locked or not. And he spent over an hour myopically focused on that problem. And because of the command and control management model, the two co-pilots could not challenge the captain. And the captain had the right to and did ignore them. And so the NTSB said, this has got to stop. When all the knowledge for a safe landing is in a cockpit, we cannot have any obstacles to getting that knowledge out. And so beginning in the uh, early to mid 1980s, United Airlines did it first. They had this particular crash, but eventually uh, all the North American uh, airlines embrace this new management model. And the peer-to-peer -peer management model has been used in cockpits for several decades now. Because in the case of the airline industry, this was a matter not just of dollars and cents, it was a matter of lives lived or lives lost. And so every time you step on an airplane, be thankful that the command and control model doesn't operate in your cockpit. And that's why we have very few airplane crashes today. Because you see, what the NTSB discovered is nobody is smarter than everybody. That's a fantastic answer to that. And as a quick side note, uh, oddly enough, today on Forbes, I read an article about uh, the safest jets on the market today. Can't remember the exact one, but yeah. versus your numbers, you know, three to four crashes per year. The current best jet has a fatality rate of 0 0.03 per million trips. And I would Largely, say it's not just better machines. It's better management because most mm. crashes were from human error, all right? Recently, we had the two with the 737 MAX and, they, and that was a mechanical issue. That was not an issue of management in the pilot, uh, but they got that cor uh, corrected quickly. Um, but, you know, th th that's why they're safe today. That To me, that's something that everybody listening to this can relate to, all right? Mm -hmm. The cockpit doesn't use command and control. They use a peer-to-peer -peer network model. Talking about the peer-to-peer -peer network model, I know we touched on it when we chatted with you yeah. a year ago. And for all the listeners, go back and listen to that podcast because it's fantastic. Um, taking it to the business side of things where so often uh, we hear large public companies, people leaving them because of their poor culture, because all the CEOs care about are the shareholders. All they care about are the shareholders. So all of the ideas then in that sense would be leading to, well, the only good ideas are share the ones that make shareholders more money. So mm -hmm. in, in your opinion and, and maybe in your book, I'm sure you touch on it. 
how can companies move away from that pigeonholed um, idea centric where it's only shareholder ideas versus good ideas or eccentric ideas? This is a very, very important point because what we're getting at is what is the purpose of a business? Now, when I went through my uh, 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 MBA program, I learned that the purpose of a business is to create shareholder wealth, which I think is getting to the orientation that you're talking about. Well, I discovered in business, that's not, that's not so. Because shareholder wealth is not an independent variable. It's a dependent variable. You can't affect it directly. The purpose of a business is to create customer value. And when you create customer value, you will create shareholder wealth. So I'm not saying shareholder wealth is not important. I believe it is important. But if your purpose really is, if, if, if you really want to create shareholder wealth, focus on the purpose of creating customer value. So let me give another practical example, all right? Let's talk about Blockbuster, okay? Let's talk about Netflix, all right? Blockbuster should be the biggest name in entertainment today that Netflix is. Why? Because several decades ago, when Blockbuster was at its height, the, um, Net the, the co-founders of Netflix went in and offered to sell themselves to Blockbuster for $50 million and said they would create Blockbuster.com. And... And this is another reason why command and control management is so dangerous. The CEO, one person, in probably what was less than a 45-minute meeting, made by himself the single decision that would destroy the company and destroy all their shareholder wealth when he turned down their offer. He didn't bring it to anybody. He didn't bring in other intelligences. He laughed and he said, no, we're creating tremendous shareholder wealth. And over the next four years, they would wind up entering the Fortune 500, which would, would have reinforced his thinking. And he was creating shareholder wealth all over the place. But he had very unhappy customers because most of the profit of blockbusters came from late fees. And their customers hated them. They even brought in a consultant who told them, you've got to get rid of these late fees because your customers hate it. And they were so angry at the consultant, they told him he didn't do his job. His job was to convince customers that late fees were actually a good deal when you combined it with all the other values they got out of Blockbuster. They had no appreciation for customer value. They were so irate that that consultant actually forgave his fee. All right. They got it all wrong. If they had stayed close to their customers, realized they didn't like this, if they had, if they had tapped into a broader base of intelligence, they would have bought Netflix. And what they turned down in not getting Netflix is Netflix grew 50 times the value that Blockbuster was on the day they turned them down. Uh, I, I, they're probably more than that now. About a year and a half ago, they were Netflix was worth 300, um, uh, 300, uh, I think it was $300 million, $300 billion, I'm sorry, $300 billion. And Blockbuster was $6 billion on the day they turned them down. So here is a practical example of how this top-down hierarchical management where elites make decisions, where their unconscious biases, okay, affect those decisions. And in the short term, it appeared to be a good decision, but it was terrible. And Blockbuster should have the position today that Netflix does. Netflix has not made those mistakes. What business was Netflix in about 30 years ago? They were sending DVDs to your home through the mail. When was the last time you got a DVD from Netflix? 
Netflix stays in constant contact with customer value. And that's, uh, and, and, and that's what peer-to-peer -peer networks do because customer value is the independent variable that delivers shareholder wealth. So if you really want to deliver shareholder wealth, you deliver customer value. You behave like Netflix, going from different product models to different product models. Not, Netflix is not afraid to kill a business and product model has been doing well for them because they realize in a rapidly changing world, you have to change with the customers. And that's why customer value and creation of customer value is the core purpose of a business. If you do that, you guarantee shareholder wealth for generation after generation of business and you adapt to change. That's, that's a phenomenal example. And <clears throat> it kind of tees up something that uh, I read that you sent us. I'm going to, going to read it um, for everybody here. So I'll, I'll read the excerpt and then I'll ask a sure. continued question from it. So you wrote in, in what you send us with the rapid emergence of the digital age, organizations suddenly find themselves in a radically different world where the key to maintaining a sustainable, uh, a sustainable competitive advantage has dramatically shifted from maintaining the status quo like blockbuster <laughs> through operational efficiency to creating the future by adapted to rapid change. This means the prime objective for the organization of the future is the ability to change as fast as the world around it. So with that, and with your example of Blockbuster and Netflix, what happens, what would happen to a, a company today that is seemingly booming, their shareholder stock, their stocks are up, they have good culture potentially, but they're not adapting to the rapid change. What happens when they don't prioritize the change that the digital age brings? What happens is what we're seeing that is happening in the Fortune 500. Companies, once they hit it, could be on it for decades. If they can't change as fast as the world around them, they drop, they die. And so the, the lifespan of a company on the Fortune 500 today is dropping dramatically. What happens is you become a one product company. And when that product, that, that particular form of the product dies, so do you. That's what happened with Blockbuster. And so what you've got to be able to do, and this is why networks are superior to hierarchies. Hierarchical structures are designed to preserve the status quo. They're primarily designed for operational efficiency. And they worked very well in the 20th century when a business model could last 40 years. And as long as you were the most operational efficient, then you could beat the market price time in and time out. And if somebody made a tweak, you could, you could uh, if, you were, uh, if you had enough history, you could adapt that tweak and, and beat your competition. And that's not the case anymore. If you're living off the operational efficiency of your current operations, you will last as long as those operations are still valued by your customers. As soon as they're not, somebody else will take your place. That's why I want, let's stick with this Blockbuster Netflix model because Blockbuster was just locked into the rental store. They had all this infrastructure around it, all right? If they had bought Netflix, when, when the co-owners offered themselves, they would have had 10 years in which to grow that product. They could have managed their own transition. They could have managed the, uh, the disposition of the stores they had. They could have managed the transition of their own customers from the, uh, you know, from the hardscape products to the digital products. Uh, but it would require a different skill set. And they would have had to adapt their skill sets over time. And all of this could have been managed. They, you do need operational efficiency, but it can't be the be all and end all. They would have learned how to be operational efficient in the new digital space. Um, and they could have used their knowledge of the operational efficiencies to eventually sunset their businesses. Their customers uh, no longer wanted to buy those products. These things happen better in a network than a hierarchy. 
because networks and hierarchies are structured very differently. Hierarchies are structured in functional departments. They assume the status quo and they want to preserve that as long as they can. They also only leverage the intelligence of an elite few. And human nature has, um, it has a tendency, uh, if we can keep doing what we're doing and do it successfully, why would I want to change? Now, in networks, you're not organized by departments. You're organized by cross-functional teams. But also, any group of people can form a team and they can go off in a different direction. They could begin working on a product that will actually kill the product that the company's doing now. And you want that functionality because somebody's going to do it. Why not you? Why are you going to let somebody else do it and get that next level of profitability? And what these teams can do is they can get together, they can build ideas, nobody can tell them no. Oftentimes, though, these teams don't have money. They are free to produce ideas, but they have to earn the money. And so in a company like W.L. Gordon Associates, uh, and they have never had bosses, and they've been organized as a network since the late 1950s when they were founded, any group of people can come up with an idea. And if that idea looks like it's going to have uh, operational validity, then that idea becomes a product and then they get funding. And an example of that in Gore is for the, uh, for the musicians who are listening to this, especially guitar players, um, the Elixir guitar strings are a product of W.L. Gore and Associates, the makers of Gore-Tex. Because a couple of their people said, you know, if we can put some of this coating on these strings, because, you know, uh, Gore-Tex is involved in, in, in chemical coatings and things like that, the strings will last longer. Now, I am a guitarist, and we used to have to change strings like every six to eight weeks. Now, a set of guitar strings can last anywhere from, anywhere from six months to a year. It totally transformed the, 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 the guitar string market. That was an idea that was just generated by a group of people who got together and came up with an idea, said, let's make a product. They presented internally. And uh, and everything is done in the context of peers, and the group of peers decided you should get funding. And so that's how they operate. So networks are designed to adapt to change. And networks are also designed so that you can handle multiple products at the same time, and you can manage your own transition. Wow. Um, that <laughs> I love that breakdown of that and to take that last example you used with Gore-Tex you know that's just an example of you know a company that for most of the general public oh they just make raincoats but they looked elsewhere right they used much to your point that peer network group of ideas and the eccentric ideas hmm. yeah. you know BASF is also very much like that yeah worldwide they're known as a chemical company that for agriculture they also make paint. They also make, you know, a yeah. vast, vast number of things. So that's that's very, very interesting. Let's just spend a couple of minutes on Gore-Tex because I think this will probably shock our listeners. Uh, Gore-Tex, uh, the makers of Gore-Tex, the company's known as W.L. Gore and Associates. And they're probably the very first company to adapt this peer-to-peer -peer network model. And they did it in 1958. I think our listeners would be surprised to learn this company today is an 11,000 person company in 30 countries around the world has made a profit in every year of its existence. And at no time in any of their history, going back to the 50s, has anyone ever had the authority to assign work to anyone else. All work is accepted rather than assigned. So our listeners may be thinking, 11,000 people, 30 countries around the world, how do you organize this? Well, Bill Gore, uh, who passed away in the 1980s, discovered the importance of, of, of a couple of numbers. Uh, and these numbers are critical if one is going to design an organization as a network. The first number is anywhere from 7 to 12. And that would be the number of people that you would have on an independent team. 
And the other number is 150. Some of our listeners may be familiar with Dunbar's number. Dunbar's number is 150. And 150 is the maximum number of people that you can know on a continual basis, know their names, and know whether they like you or not. You can see why hierarchies start when companies get above 150. So when Bill Gore first started this concept, he noticed it worked very well until it got to about 150 people. And then things started to break down as they got close to 200 people. And so what he did, he resisted building a hierarchy and said, I'll just divide them into two autonomous groups. And so my understanding is um, some Gore campuses are literally campuses where there are different, uh, different buildings. Uh, each, though, is autonomous. People can move back. And again, people can move back and forth. So if, if they finish work in, in one place, and then, then, then they can go to another one. But each one is autonomous and, and 150 or less, which means that when Bill Gore discovered this, probably sometime in the 1960s, he actually discovered Dunbar's number before Dunbar, who, who came up with it in the 70s. <laughs> so those numbers are critical. Um, if you're going to build your company as a network, you have to keep those two numbers in mind, between 7 and 12. And then as you approach 200, divide the group in half. But 150 is your ideal number. Yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah, wow is right. Um, so I have, I have one more question around that Gore-Tex and Bill Gore's ideologies. Yeah. Is it, I mean, I think it's a very known topic. Jason and I talk about it lots, um, the ego. You know, ego can be a good thing. We talk about it a lot in the good, you know, using alter egos to focus and, and mm -hmm. channel, you know, certain ideas. But is it a, is it as easy or simple enough to say that the egos of these hierarchy, uh, hierarchy based companies with, you know, very stout CEOs that are very prominent, that they don't look to somebody like Gore-Tech and go, we just got to do what they did. It, it works masterfully, but does their ego sometimes get in the way of going, no, we can't be like them because we're us. Well, you, you hit on a very important point, and this is perhaps a sensitive point. And it is this top down hierarchies in their leadership draw an overrepresentation of narcissists. And the narcissistic personality doesn't have empathy and is overly focused on control. And I think one of the reasons that top-down hierarchical structures can't make the transition is because they attract the wrong types of leaders. Narcissists do not operate in environments where we're all equals, where there aren't people above other people, where I've got to pay attention and balance the needs in a collegial way of perhaps 15 to 20 people. Because in a network, in addition to your team of seven to 12, you may wind up working closely with anywhere from 15 to 20 people. And so this requires a whole different paradigm on leadership because in the hierarchy, the elite few get to be the leaders. They get to be in control, all right? In a hierarchy, this is a radically different paradigm. Number one, well, let me, let me, number one is everyone's a leader. And I'm reminded of the story. Uh, one of the other companies I, I describe in the book is a company called Morningstar. And they went up from being a startup to the world's largest tomato processor. Um, and I had the privilege to speak at their annual meeting uh, about a year ago. Um, but, uh, uh, in, in Morningstar, all right, everybody is involved in the decision making, all right? Nobody winds up having authority over anybody else. And so when uh, the management writer, Gary Hamill, uh, who some of our listeners may be familiar with, was visiting Morningstar, he was with the founder, uh, Chris Rufer. And he said to Chris, this is amazing. You have no managers, yet you get so much work done. 
And Chris turned to Gary and said, Gary, you've got it wrong. Everyone is a manager here. And so narcissists don't like that. The idea that everyone is a leader and in the network, everyone is a leader. They rotate the role uh, or they share the role as needed. This is what's happening in the cockpit. What had to change was one person is the leader and nobody challenges that leader. Now, everyone in the cockpit is a leader. And sometimes they'll bring a pilot sitting in the seat up front. This was a change that happened. As some of us may recall the, the flight a few years ago um, that, that crash landed in Iowa, where two thirds of the passengers survived a plane that had lost all its hydraulics. I mean, it, it, in prior days, it couldn't have landed. They There were three people in the cockpit, but one of the flight attendants said, we've got a captain sitting back here who's uh, off it. And they said, bring him on up. In the old days, no captain sitting in a passenger seat would ever think of inviting themselves into the cockpit. That, no, bring him in. We want as many leaders in this cockpit. And those people found a way to crash land a crippled plane and save two out of every three of the people on it when in prior days, that would have been a doomed flight. All right, so th that's why I think uh, narcissistic leaders in particular will have a hard time. And, and so I would, if there are any board members listening to this, change your paradigm on who you hire as a leader. You're not looking for the smartest individual. You're looking for the individual who's going to bring together better than anybody else all the smarts you already have, because that level of smarts is going to be higher than any single person can do. And the other thing I would ask board members to think about and reflect upon, something changed in the early 2000s, and it is this, the ability for a single person to process everything happening in real time. There will be no more Lee Iacocas. Those of us who are those who are a little closer to my age will remember that in the 1970s and 80s, Lee Iacocca single-handedly saved the Chrysler Corporation from the brink of disaster. And he did it by himself. He had the strategy. He was the smartest person in the industry. Uh, and he was able to do it because he could process everything happening in this market in real time. Today, that luxury doesn't exist. No single leader can process everything happening in real time. And so the truly, the truly intelligent chief executive is one who builds an incredible team, is one who knows how to get past the biases of individuals by combining all their knowledge. That's what you need in leadership today, who can build a team of leaders in a network your team of leaders, and there are senior teams of leaders in, network, in networks. Um, uh, these teams emerge and handle some of the more strategic issues, but they operate as a team. Now, again, speaking to board members who might be listening here, you know, as well as we know, that the most dysfunctional team in an organization is the senior leadership team. Why? They're all fighting to be the next CEO. They are all withholding a certain amount of information because they don't want someone else to have an advantage. So when you build a top-down hierarchy, you create a very dysfunctional dynamic in the organization, and that is the single CEO that every senior leader is aspiring to. Stop it. What they should aspire to be is part of the senior leadership team. You see, one of the big differences between hierarchies and networks is how power works. In a hierarchy, power is a function of force. People have the legitimate authority to command people to do what they otherwise would not choose to do or else lose their job. Power in a network is a product of an entirely di different dimension of power. It's not power, it's force. Okay, it's power as energy. Power is synergistic. Power is not an a priori structure. 
power is a dynamic that flows from the work of the groups. Synergistic power is more likely to be focused on customer values, on how we are in the market. Coercive power is focused upon the four walls of the organization and my position within the building. That is not market facing. And then you combine that with you just focused on shareholder wealth. So all I care about is the room I'm in and the dollars we make. Do you think that's a formula for success? No. You want your organization continually focused on the value we deliver, the uh, way we affect customers' lives, how we stay in touch in the market. You want every single person in the company focused outside the organization. And here's the thing about synergistic power. When you've got synergistic power, you don't have all of these rivalries. You are likely to build highly co cohesive teams. That's why networks, that's why nobody's smarter than everybody. Mm -hmm. Wow. Um, just on a, a couple of points you just brought up in, in the last part there, because I was going to ask you about uh, the change in organizational dynamics from power as force to power as energy, which you, you've already gotten into. And also about the leadership team and uh, around that, because in your book, you talk about uh, leadership switching, the locus of leadership switching to the team. But mm -hmm. based on what you just talked about in terms of the leadership team itself, so I'm going to change my question a little bit there is, is kind of, could you explain to our listeners like how, uh, like where does the, the real change in the locus of leadership need to start happening to switch to the team? And, and how does that sort of then sort of percolate uh, throughout the organization? Like how, how, do, how do leaders make that happen? The whole, the whole focus of the leadership team, uh, the leadership teams need to go through an entire reconstruction. One of the things I like to do when I work with leadership teams is um, I'll, give them, I'll give them two post-it notes. And I'll say, on the first one, I want you to add three numbers to add up to be 100. So write down three numbers. The percentage of time that you spend on strategy, percentage of time you spend on people, percentage of time you spend on operations. I get those. I say, on the second one, write down the percentage of time you should spend on strategy, that you should spend on people, and that you should spend on operations. Over the years, I found I, I get really common results. The first set is 10, 10, 80, 10% 10 strategy, 10% people, 80% operations. The second set of numbers that they suggest should be 40, 40, 20. 40% 40 strategy, 40% people. Right. And I'll look at them and say, you have a 60 point gap in strategy. Okay, um, you've got, I'm sorry, you have a 60 point gap in operations. You're spending 80% of your time in operations and it should be 20. And then I'll look at them and say, you're the leadership team. Who the hell is doing strategy in this organization? <laughs> All right, most leadership teams, go, they'll do, you know, they'll have a, they'll go off site for strategy once a year. All right. And again, what they're going to do is probably reinforce what they've been doing. And the idea is make as minimal change as we have to. Uh, the, the whole dynamic is terrible. A true leadership team in a network. Mm -hmm. and, and this was a practice. I, I was able uh, to bring this practice into uh, the, the business unit that I led within the Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, organization in the United States. Um, I, I was the chief executive of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Federal Employee Program, which was a business alliance of the 39 separate plans. They were 39 separate Blue Cross Blue Shield companies at the time. I think there's a few in number today. Mm -hmm. But uh, we were leading a network, but we were behaving like it was a hierarchy. And so when we adapted the network management style, uh, it went over successfully. We really did. I mean, we had tremendous growth tremendous growth, both in terms of enrollment and in terms of profitability. Um, but one of the practices I did with the senior leadership team is we didn't go off-site 
once a year. We had an off-site day once every two weeks because I wanted our team to be really focused on strategy. And the way we conducted those meetings is we shared the leadership. And so we would spend the day deeply, deeply diving into the most important things happening in the marketplace, having incredibly deep discussions, thorough understanding. We also set up a practice that no person among that senior leadership team could make a unilateral decision that would affect others without bringing it to this group. And so all of our major decisions for all of the areas were done as a team. We did team-based decision-making. And in the course of doing that, what happened is if somebody is saying, I'm thinking of doing this, then somebody else could react and say, well, if you do that, it's gonna have this impact. How does this operate in the hierarchical organization? Well, somebody says, I think I'm going to do this, and they do it. And all of a sudden, it's operational. And somebody pops up and says, you didn't talk to me about that. And the first person says, I didn't know this affected you. Now you've got, you've got a hole you got to dig out, all right? And, and you've, 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 you've got the horse out of the barn, and getting it back in is going to be hard. It's going to be a lot of work, and it's a lot of money that doesn't have a high return. Well, by going offsite every two weeks and somebody saying, I think I'm going to do this, somebody says, wait a minute, if you did this, this is going to affect this. We now have to solve for this and that. And this is what would happen with the team. And somebody else might jump in and say, well, wait a minute. If you two do these two things, it affects me. And what we began to realize by going offsite every two weeks, thinking deeply, we developed a capacity for dealing with complexity. And that's one of the things that's changed in the 21st century. Mm. We don't have complicated problems anymore. We have complex problems. The 20th century, problems were complicated. Why? They were all mechanical in nature. And the thing about a machine is you can handle parts in isolation. It's just think of a car. If you've got a problem with a carburetor, I just go in, work with the carburetor, replace the carburetor. Just tie it together with the other parts. The other parts I don't have to think about. The car works again. That was the problem calculus for dealing with 20th century business problems. Everything was more or less mechanical in nature. When your problems are complex, you can only deal with them holistically. You want the ability to for, for people thinking of doing something to run it by others so that when you solve for the problem, you are solving for this, that, and the other. And this is what happened in the leadership team. And so we're not saying you can't do this. We believe, all of us would agree, you have to do this. But in doing this, we have to think about that and we have to think about the other. We're solving for three things, not one thing. And this saves time and this saves money. I was in the health insurance industry. We have among the most complex information systems that you could possibly have. We used this thinking to put in place major system changes. And when we did it, it was on time, under budget. And uh, the last time we did it, not a single customer facing issue. That is very, very rare in the health insurance industry. Why? Because we constantly managed all our interactions in this team learning based approach. So, when uh, in your Blue Cross Blue Shield experience, um, did that sort of make its way out into the rest of the organization? Did it sort of live beyond you or kind of what happened there? And because you talk about in your book as well about the Achilles heel of traditional organizations. Um, and so I'm sort of curious as to how that might kind of relate, right, uh, to that Achilles heel. So maybe explain what that is and and about the difficulty of changing traditional organizations. Yeah, you bring up a very important point. Um, and this has been happened in several places. All right. Um, what tends to happen is if a leader comes in and puts in place a, uh, uh, a network-based model, 
but the fun, the larger organization doesn't change. Then the next person who comes in can do whatever they want. All right. And uh, to some extent, that's that's what happened. And it happened at Ford. Alan Mulally managed like this. Alan Mulally had his senior leadership team get together once a week. All right. Not one, we were once every, he was once a week. And he had a senior leaders telling him when he says, you know, you're going to, we're going to have this meeting every week. All the leaders got to be there because we have to be in the presence of each other. Mm -hmm. uh, many of the leaders were saying, well, no, I, I, there's other issues I have to handle. And, and he just smiled at them and said, well, if you need to handle those other issues, we can let that happen. We'll have somebody else be the leader of the area. And the people got the message real quick. Oh, <laughs> we, we, we need to be here. Okay. And because he wanted them solving problems in the presence of each other. Um, when Alan left, okay, um, his successor, um, well, didn't leave things as they were, and he would later be replaced. And so this is, the, the great challenge is, this isn't something that you want to stop at the individual leader level. You really have to change the organization. You have to have the organization be such that the chief executive officer, if they were to bark a command, people would laugh and say, good luck with that. Okay. And that's what would happen in W.O. Gordon Associates. Does W.O. Gordon Associates have a CEO? Yes, they do. And it's for external purposes. Okay. But if the CEO were to give a command, nobody would pay attention. And they would, and because they don't have to, because that's not how things work around here. We work, we, we leverage our collective intelligence, and that's how this organization is designed. But needless to say, in a company like uh, Gordon Associates, uh, the CEO would never think of barking a command. This is, this is a hard one for us to get uh, to wrap around. I mean, uh, James Surawiecki wrote this wonderful book called The Wisdom of Crowds where he really delved into uh, uh, how crowds tend to be smarter than individuals. And I want to hasten to add, these are diverse crowds. If you have uniformity of thinking, you don't have a wise crowd. You've got group think. You've got a mob, all right? For collective intelligence to work, all right, for the group to be smarter than the individual, it must welcome diversity of opinion. But Sarah Wyke said, Collective intelligence is something that just baffles us. And even when we see it, and even when we see how well it works, it's just hard for us to believe. Now, let me give you an example. This will probably blow the listeners' minds. I've been using collective intelligence group techniques for decades now. And a couple of years ago, I was on an assignment, and there was a very difficult problem that the company had. They were within... Um, uh, several weeks of having something go live, and it was it, it, it was in, it was in trouble. Um, and twenty five people were getting together, and I was asked to facilitate a five hour session where we would go through a collective intelligence exercise uh, to help solve the problem. When I arrived there, they said, "You don't have five hours; you have three hours." And I thought, "I don't have enough time." Because what I normally would do is put people in the small groups because it's good to get different perspectives, okay? Diversity of opinion. Don't solve a problem. If you've got 20 people in a room, break into about three or four groups uh, and go back and forth between small groups and a large group. You can rapidly get different perspectives. And this is another factor of nobody smarter than everybody. Well, anyway, I couldn't do that because that takes about three hours and I need two hours to work with the ideas that come out of that. And I was a little annoyed, but I had just read something and I decided about a week or two and I said, well, I don't know if this is gonna work or not, but I got three hours and I only got an hour to do what I would have done in three hours. So I'll try it out and see what happens. And here's what happened. I gave the 25 people lots of post-its notes. And I said, write as many as you want, one idea per note on how to solve this problem. And I want people to see this because this is gonna to seem totally illogical. 
We got 250 post-it notes. We put them on a big wall, all right? And I said to the group, you have 10 minutes. And I gave each of them strips of six dots. And I said, go look at those items and put dots on what you think are the important items. And somebody said to me, well, don't you think we should review all the items first and collapse the duplicates? I said, no. And we'll never be able to read them all in 10 minutes. I said, I know. You got 10 minutes to vote your dots. So they did. When they were done, I said, all right. I had another flip chart. And I said, start calling out the items that have lots of dots. So somebody would identify one and somebody else would go, oh, this one is, is just like it. And I'd say, so this idea has lots of dots. All right, we don't even need to know the exact number. We wound up getting 14 ideas out of the 250 on this second sheet of paper. I gave them a second set of four dots. And I said, vote four dots any way you want. You can put four on one item or four across four items on this list of 14. And we got to when I normally get to when I have small groups do this and they have time for discussion and go through this. There was a top four items. And by top four items, it would be votes like, you know, uh, 28, 27, 26, 25, 13. You, you see a break point. I turned to the group and said, if we do these four things, will it solve your problem? And they said, yes, it will. And then I said to them this, and this was news to me because I'd never tried this before. This was, this was necessity being the mother of invention. It was something I had read about, had a chance to try it, didn't plan on doing it. I said, look what happened here. In less than, less than an hour, we have identified 250 ideas. We got it down to a mid -lift of, list of 14. And from that, you identified the four things that will solve your problem. And we didn't have a single word of discussion. Nobody is smarter than everybody. We tapped in the, that, what I learned that day, and I've been doing collective intelligence workshops and exercises for, at that point, a couple of decades. And what I learned that day is the collective intelligence is already in the room. It's like a cloud. The rain is already there. We just need to gather it. And, it, and, and you, you, the gathering requires certain processes. And, and what, and Sir Wiking in his book, Wisdom of Crowd, identifies them, and it is four. And we're in trouble with this today as we look at our larger societies. The first two, we are seriously lacking in our larger society. First is diversity of opinion. You must welcome different ways of thinking. Second, you must be free to independently express your idea without any fear of retaliation. As a society, we are in worse trouble with these two factors today than at any point in my lifetime. And I've been around a while, all right? The third thing you have to have is you need a lot of local knowledge, especially in rapidly changing times. You don't have that in the C-suite. You don't have local knowledge. Local knowledge is knowledge from people close to the processes, or close to the uh, operations. And the last thing is you need an aggregation mechanism. And that's what those dots were in that exercise. Dot voting was a form of aggregating. And when I do dot voting, I always say, no matter how many dots I give people, you can vote them any way you want. If you feel passionate about an item, you can put four, you can put four or five or six dots on that one item, all right? Because you... You, it, this is a bit counterintuitive. It also allows for minority ideas where there's lots of passion to come forward. And so, um, you know, these types of aggregation mechanisms have been well thought out over the years. Um, when I was the chief executive of the Blue Cross Blue Shield Federal Employee Program, collective intelligence was how what we leveraged to uh, achieve the success that we did. Tell you one thing, if uh, I could put a bunch of dots on your screen right now, I probably would. And I think a lot of people should when they buy your book. Um, so your book is for leaders who are open to learning about uh, extraordinary advantages of self-managed networks. So it's for everybody because everybody's a leader. Yes. So where can everybody find your book when it uh, gets released here? 
Okay, well, the launch is uh, on February 20th, and uh, they can find it on Amazon. And I've made it available in any format you like. It's, it's available as a hardback, a paperback, and in Kindle. So obviously, we're going to send the Hive Nation to go buy Nobody is Smarter Than Everybody because it's a great piece that I think a lot of people can learn from. Other than that, Rod, where can uh, individuals connect with you? Where can they find you? Well, my website is rodcollins.net. Um, I write a Substack column. Um, and so uh, they can find me on Substack. And, and again, they can um, uh, they can see that. And, uh, uh, and I also do some keynote speaking on this. So. Excellent. And all that information is on my website, rodcollins.net. Excellent. Um, last one before we let you go, because we know your time is valuable and um, you've written your book. So what's, what's next? What's next for Rod Collins? <laughs> uh, well, what's next is um, uh, I'm working on, on a new book and it's about two thirds done uh, about what we should learn uh, from our mismanagement of COVID which was one of the worst applications of top-down command and control management we've ever seen. And uh, if we had taken a network approach that honored all voices and had, if you will, cross-functional teams rather than focus on one problem, uh, which, and, and we're, we're gonna be living with the consequences of, of the coronavirus and COVID for, I think for at least a decade. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't think they'll there'll be very positive consequences you know, But that's the next book I'm working on. What if we had applied collective intelligence to uh, one of the most difficult problems that we've had? Mm -hmm. uh, Larry, do you have any, any final comments? Like I had a bunch of questions, but to be honest, like when Greg would ask you a question and in your, your answer, you would touch on some of the things I actually wanted to ask you about. So uh, which is kind of what I expect in, in talking to you, Rod, because it was the same like the last time, right? Like we got going and by the time we got to the end, there was just so many different things that we had touched on that, uh, to be honest, we couldn't have even thought of those questions. Yeah. And, and that's the actual joy of talking to you. Because I just, want to, I just want to add one thing. If we could, if we could run the world as a network rather than hierarchy, if we could appreciate diversity of opinion and collective intelligence, we would live in a better world. Oh, and the absolutely. companies that do this are living in better companies. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's phenomenal. Well, Rod, we appreciate you uh, joining us again. Congratulations on your book release. And uh, for now, Hive Nation, we're out. <laughs>